Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're so glad that you have joined us. We like talking about plants every week of the year, so we wanna hear what your questions are and we are looking forward to that. Well, before that, I'll introduce myself. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I'll handle cut flower questions, perennials, et cetera. But I have three talented folks here with me. I just can't wait to introduce them. Let's find out who they are and they're gonna answer an email or have a show and tell as well. Let's start first with Chuck Voigt. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Diane. It's great to be here. Um, I am in the crop sciences department also. I teach horticulture, vegetables and herbs are my specialties, but uh, you know, I went through the curriculum, so I, I, I'm pretty good on lots of things. Uh, tonight I'd like to show uh, this and uh, some of the people on the panel guessed parsnip, but it's closely related to that. It's actually root parsley, which is just a, a derivative of, of the parsley that, that we eat all the time. Uh, has a, a parsley flavor in the root, uh, a, maybe a little bit of a nuttiness to it, kind of not really like a parsnip, but, but that same sweet uh, kind of nicely melting flesh in there. Uh, it's a nice change of pace. Um, I think the tops you could you could probably use as a as a seasoning too, if 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 you really needed to, sort of like a uh, a uh, flat leaf parsley. And while we're talking about herbs, I really do want to uh, tell people that that my very final Herb Day program is going to be this January twenty third here in Urbana, and and now is the time to start registering for that. Uh, there. There's an online thing, but it's a long, long address that I, I can't ever remember. Um, you can call my, my secretary, Linda Harvey, at 217-244-1666. Uh, and uh, she can get you hooked up to, to do online reserva uh, reservations or whatever. Uh, also, L-H-A-R-V-E-Y at I-L-L-I-N-O-I-S dot E-D-U. We'll do the trick as well, and uh, we can get you get you in the swing for that. Uh, Diane is usually there uh, mm -hmm. having fun with us uh, because this is the last year. We're, we've expanded the program. There'll probably, be, there'll pro probably be more be more music. Yeah, five of my my favorite herb people from across the country. Uh, I'll be singing a little bit, and uh, the retail area is going to be chock full of, of fun things to buy and, and get ready for next season. So uh, come and celebrate the 17th and final UVI Herb Day. January 23rd, 2016. Herb Day is just a great way to break up winter. I guess if we have winter, <laughs> but anyway, it's a great way to break up the non-active gardening season. Let's put it that way. There we go. Thank you, Chuck, very much. And now let's go to David Robson. Hi, David. Thanks, Diane. I'm David Robson. I'm also with the Department of Crop Sciences. I'm a pesticide specialist and a general horticulturalist. So I can, I'll handle anything except the fruits and vegetables. And by the way, the Chuck, do you cook or eat the root of the parsley? I think more often it gets cooked. Okay. But I think you could, uh, as with parsnips, you could you could you know, like clean it up a little bit and just grate it into something, okay. and or chop it and put it in a soup. Or, I mean, it's I think fresh mm. or cooked, but uh, probably more often cooked. Okay. My question deals with a regular viewer uh, who wants to know about watering trees and shrubs during the winter time. Uh, is there a specific prog uh, process? Um, how much water? When to water? What happens if the temperature stays below 20 degrees for an extended period of time? Do I water? Um, so in, in short, how do you take care of plants that you planted during the winter time to make sure that they don't turn brown? Well, watering is important and going into the winter, making sure that there's enough water around the root system is gonna be great. Once the soil is frozen, the roots aren't gonna absorb much water. So if you water when it's 20 below, you're probably just gonna puddle on top of the ground. And if you're doing that around trees and shrubs, you can actually kill the crown of the plant with the freezing and the thawing of that water around that base of that tree or shrub. Prior to the ground freezing though, make sure that that ground is saturated, not soggy, not excessively wet, because that can actually cause some of the roots to actually shatter during the winter time, 
during that freezing and thawing. And that would apply to perennials that you may have planted in the fall, bulbs you may have planted in the fall. If you planted some blackberry plants recently, put them in the ground and make sure that they are well watered. And then really for any newly planted trees or shrubs, it doesn't hurt to mulch them for the winter time too. The roots grow best when the ground is between freezing and about 65 degrees. So the longer you can keep that soil from freezing, those roots are gonna keep growing and become established. Very good. And it covered the whole gamut of things that we could have planted <clears throat> late. Except grass. Exactly. So, sorry, okay. but watering the grass is okay too. Which yeah. it will and get. And some it. of it is growing really well right now with these temperatures since we haven't had. I heard super mowing cold today. Yeah, believe it or not, I saw when I was attending the University of Nebraska, they planted grass seed on Thanksgiving and watered it for the next six weeks. Got it up and growing, got to an inch, turned the water off and let it snow over the top. And it was the neatest looking lawn come spring. Perennial rye? No, and they did bluegrass. Bluegrass. Yeah. Interesting. It was, you have to I, I pick your believe, year for yes. that. Oh yeah, I couldn't wow. believe they did it so late. And probably did. warm wow. water too to keep <laughs> that soil warm so it germinates. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, person who talked about Nebraska, who might you be? Oh, this is Jim <laughs> Schuster. Introduce yourself and your uh, email, please. I'm, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired crop science uh, worker. I majored in horticulture and plant uh, pathology. And my question tonight is weeping cherry and why it died. Uh, it was uh, basically beautiful uh, up to last year and three-fourths of the tree died during the summer and then by the end of the summer the last part of the tree finished dying and you want to know why. There are two major, I mean there are lots of reasons, but two major ones that will kill a cherry tree and basically anything in the prunus uh, family or genus and that are boars and cankers and both of them are drawn to your trees because the tree is under stress. And Dave mentioned before that winter uh, can kill a tree, and if it doesn't outright kill a tree, it stresses the tree to the point where it will allow the cankers and borders to come in, and also the you know, drought, uh, flooding, uh, planting too deep, girdling, all, anything that will stress the tree. And one other thing that is a stress on tree is age. It's not uncommon that any of the trees in the Prunus genus are, when they're over 10, 12 years of age, are stressed. And therefore, they tend to have a short life because of the boars and cankers attacking them. Uh, the boars tend to attack near the uh, soil line, somewhere four or five inches below to four or five inches above. Cankers will be anywhere on the tree. Both of them will cause bleeding on the trunk and eventually death. Yes. Okay, very good. Wow, we had nicely interesting emails and show and tells. Well, let's go to the Did You Know video section next. The world's oldest living rosebush is thought to be 1,000 years old. Today, it continues to bloom on the wall of the Hildesheim Cathedral in Germany. Now that is amazing. Yes, it is. Okay, well, let's go to the phone lines and we want to go to Quinn's question or comment about weeds on line two. Hi, Quinn. Hello, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad I got through. Hello, everyone. Wow, Hello. enthusiasm. Hi. Okay. <laughs> I have a large yard. Uh, I'm a homeowner. It sit on two lots, and I'm not a, I'm, this is all new to me. This summer, I had these weeds people call cuckabers that cuckaburs mm. or something, they little hard, sticky things that get into my dog's hair, my little dog's oh, hair. Oh, yes. Yes. And I was wondering, what can I do this year to keep them from coming back? What, what do I need to do? What I need to put down? Because they're awful. If you step on them, they're hard to kill. I tried weed killer. And what should I do? I'm going to say if she's tried weed killer and it didn't really work, she probably needs to go with a stronger weed killer that she's spot treating those weeds. You locate those weeds and something like glyphosate, which is sold as Roundup or Cleanup, might okay. be the best product to use. Obviously, according to the directions on the label, do not make it any stronger than what it says. 
Uh, there's a couple ways you can apply it. You can put it in a sprayer and then direct the spray. I've seen people take a broomstick, attach a, um, a cloth like a washcloth or a sponge to it and then use that as a dabber and just go out and dab each of those weeds. Remember that if it starts dripping and you're dripping around the grass, you're going to see this nice little dead strip in the grass too. But uh, it should kill the weeds and all. Um, I have the a roots meaning yes as well learn to identify cocklebur it's easy super easy to pull young and they have interesting not that I know this by first hand <laughs> but interesting f kind of purplish flecks on them when they're small and once you learn what they are they're very the easy leaves. and definitely anytime pull. you can pull any plant as opposed to using a chemical that's the best thing to do too but you have to learn what it looks like first so right. and that's usually after you realize you've got the problem. How well did they stand up to mowing? I was going to say, the other thing is that if she mows oh, yeah, regularly, she's not going to have the seed, and so that's mm -hmm. going to protect the dog somewhat. Because it doesn't, it's not like crabgrass that'll creep along the ground. It is an upright weed. But if you yeah. see those cockleburs in the grass, I would get rid of them. They have a wonderfully long germination time. Yes. And, and, and fairly unique cotyledons when they first unfurl. Yeah, so I would remove those because that hurts. And I'm sure the, the animals hate that. Oh. Oh, boy. Quinn, that was a great question and a specific weed cockleburr. It's not a fun one. All right, let's go on to line three. And Bill has a question about hibiscus or a comment. Hi, Bill. Well, hello. Uh, we have a hibiscus plant that we've had for about six months outdoors, and it just bloomed beautifully all summer. And we moved inside into the house about a month ago into the living room, and it still bloomed beautifully until just about a few days ago it stopped blooming entirely and started putting out leaves instead of buds. Is that something to be expected? I would, yeah. I would say it's probably the reduced light, light, light yep. reduced humidity. So I would say that's to be expected. Were they the bright, shiny leaves? Yes, they are. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's the tropical one, and and if you don't have a, put it in the highest light place you can possibly get in the uh, house. Do they do well under fluorescent light for like 16 hours a day? They would. Yeah. It the might be more commitment than most people want, but yeah, yeah they and would. He sh and he should always, when you bring it in, be aware of sucking insects you bring in. Mm -hmm. So if oh, you yeah. see sap start dripping, that's a and good then point. maybe losing some of the older leaves also, due to the fact of reduced light from outside to inside. So remove those leaves, take them off, and hopefully what you have left will do great. And then put it outside next spring. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Bill, for your question. And let's go to line four. Nathan has Creeping Charlie. Okay, Nathan, <coughs> hi there. Hi, yes, um, I have dogs and I didn't treat my lawn for a week as much this uh, summer. And Creeping Charlie had came over and kind of I, taken over half my yard. I just wonder how do I go by killing it or do I seed the yard and then try to kill it next spring or how do I go by getting rid of Creeping Charlie? Okay, who wants to start? First of all, we prefer to call it ground ivy. <laughs> oh, we do. <laughs> Rather than Creeping Charlie. <coughs> oh, <laughs> duh. <laughs> Chuck. Yes, Chuck. Creeping Chuck. Charles. Creeping Chuck. <laughs> and we didn't say creepy Chuck. We just, I mean, Charlie. <laughs> no. Okay. Creeping. Ground ivy. All right. Yes. Never mind it. Yes. So go ahead with your how to take care of ground ivy. I have not Charlie. had tremendous success oh. since, since they took Silvex off the market. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I had it in my yard, and I sprayed every 10 to 14 days until it started dying back. Uh, and with your dog though, the recommendation is don't let them out until it has dried. And if your dog chews on grass on a regular basis, you're gonna have to keep a good eye on him that he's not chewing in the area where you treat. Uh, and I had it and I just made a big patio in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, that's, that was one of the reasons I went that route because it was gonna be, like Chuck said, next to impossible to try to control. And some people do the spray and then mowing high, mm -hmm. of course, always weeding. 
Oh, and you know it make, spreads by the by does. the stems, but it also drops seeds. So even if you successfully kill all the vegetative growth, you still got seeds that are gonna that are gonna yeah. give you trouble and, coming and back. And birds love to <coughs> and give it to the add it to your landscape. They definitely yeah. do not think, oh, I'm just gonna till this up because then you have ten thousand oh. pieces and you got a nice carpet. Yeah. But wasn't it a long time ago? Wasn't there? A, what, it was brought into the United States as a ground as, cover, wasn't right. it? For yeah. ornamental. Yeah. 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 I planted it at the home farm as a ground cover, not yeah. knowing. Yeah. yeah. And they were <laughs> very good in shape, but they didn't realize how well it did in the sun either. Yeah. Yeah. When you have one small clump of it, it's beautiful. Yeah. When yes. it takes over the yard, yeah. not so much. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It may be an ongoing <clears throat> hobby <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> to, to yeah. take care of that. All right. Well, thank you for that, and we'll. There's a many-fold way to try to get rid of it, including moving. Okay, <laughs> so let's go to line five, and Ed has a, a hickory uh, a tree Ooh. question. All right, line five. Hi, Ed. Yes, I am. Thank you for letting me in on this. You are welcome. I've got a problem with pecan trees. Uh, the worms have ate all the nuts. There's probably 10% left that was good. What's going on this year? Last year we had a real good crop. Okay, I'm kind of looking at you two on the end. I guess that's us. I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not real familiar with with pecan insects. I guess yeah. the only thing I would say is that if he didn't have it last year, he may have had a lot of predators. I mean, most insects tend to be kind of cyclic. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. you have big populations, and then the predators build up, and control that and then when the predators don't have the food then the insect population builds up um, timing is everything with a lot of the insects on the trees especially with uh, temperatures and so forth I guess I would say if there were worms in the nuts the best bet is making sure that those nuts are completely composted or buried or given mm. to the garbage and not allowed to uh, uh, remain around the base of the tree. So cleanliness for cleanliness, this. Cleanliness, sanitation, yeah. the, the big old sanitation. Me, if you can burn them, or if you can't burn them, I would get them off the property as opposed to composting them. Absolutely. <laughs> or, well, probably not even deep burying would, well, I except they're awfully thin, them. yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> burning would might be, not be too bad. So there's some ideas for you. Okay, well, let's do some uh, show and tell. All right. How about starting with you, Chuck? Okay, I brought in two different uh, uh, varieties of uh, Asian persimmons. Uh, I planted two uh, American persimmons this year, which are much smaller and, and have more tendency to be astringent. But these were in the grocery store. You see, they seem to be in, in peak season. There's two kinds, there are the two varieties. Uh, this one is a variety called Fuyu, F-U-Y-U, and it is supposed to be flattened like that. And if, if you do your research, a, this one is supposed to be firm when you eat it, like a crunchy, like an apple or a pear. So the fact that this one is, is hard as a rock means that it's not so f as far off as you would think. This one is one called Hachia, H-A-C-H-I-Y-A, and reading about this one, they said this one should be about the, the consistency of a water balloon <laughs> when, really? when it's ready to eat. And this one is much, much softer. Uh, so that, uh, that uh, seems, to be, seems to be working. Unfortunately, these are not winter hardy where we are in, in the central part of the Midwest. I think by the time you get into southern Illinois, they, some of these, the hardier ones, start to, start to be good and then uh, <clears throat> further away. Um, they're they're really kind of interesting, and the Asian ones are are naturally low in in astringency, so usually you don't get that that dry puckery feeling <laughs> that you get when you when you when you try the the native ones. Uh, you know, they say if it's really soft and almost rotten. Well, I picked them up where they're almost running through my fingers, and I still get that. Mm -hmm. So wow. I think a lot of the, the the named cultivars have been selected because they're they're lower in that astringency okay. and, and a little more likely to be easy to eat. But these are these are yeah, in the grocery store, kind of medium price. They're they're not they're not you know as cheap as some of the the locally grown fruits, but not horrible. I think mm. they were like three for two dollars, which depending yeah. on where your budget situation is, might be a fun thing to try. They make good bread, cakes, and puddings. Yep, excellent. Not really good in fruit salads. <laughs> I could see that. It'd yeah. be a very quick turnaround. Right. And 
Do you know what the primary use of persimmon wood was? No, I don't. Woods? Golfing Ethnic. woods. Golf, golf club woods, heads. Really? Yeah, it's, it's very close to ebony as, as far as a relative, and both dioper, diasporas. diasporas. And so ebony, hardwood, persimmon, Why? golf clubs. You <laughs> folks golf woods. Yes. are a wealth of information. Um, persimmons. So, persimmon. so the new steel folks. drivers have, have kind of saved a few persimmon trees. Right. I see, okay. <laughs> Very good. And persimmons and pawpaws are the only two native fruits, tree fruits, to the Midwest. Very yeah, interesting. I know, it's just those weird things. No, these are good things. <laughs> and with that, then David, go right into your email. Okay, my email was somebody who had uh, some burr oaks and they started growing this year. They, uh, the, the burr oaks, the acorns came off the trees and they planted them. Uh, they assumed they were burr oaks. Um, burr oaks, really, as far as an acorn, you should know what a burr oak is. I mean, it looks like, unlike any other acorn with that nice top that's kind it's of fuzzy. Huge. But it almost covers the entire Right, yeah. right. Um, <clears throat> but most of the white oaks do germinate very quickly in the fall, and so if it was a white oak or a burr oak, it was possible that it was germinating, and they wanted to know what to do with it for the winter. And again, it's another thing that if you have a plant uh, that you're growing for the winter and that's kind of tender like this and it's already sprouted, you can put it in the ground, but you really need to provide some protection for it, both against the animals that still might feed on it, but then again, the ex extensive cold as well. And so I would probably bury the container in the ground, mm -hmm. maybe close to the garage or close to the foundation of the house so you can have some warmth. And then as it gets colder and you're not seeing any really growth continue on the plant, cover it with uh, loose leaves or loose straw, maybe even make a chicken wire cage mm -hmm. around it again to kind of protect it. And it goes back to the watering, make sure that it's watered right before the ground freezes. And the next spring, keep your fingers crossed that they'll start growing and take off. Any, any Excellent. Con any concern about uh, voles or rabbits eating the top off? Oh, yeah. There's, that's all the, I mean, we got voles, rabbits, we got but other the chicken things. wire The chicken wire take care might, of that. might prevent that, yes. And the clay pot or the plastic yeah, the pot, pot from the side. Right, and then the nice thing about having them in a clay or plastic pot is that you're not going to get an extremely long taproot to begin with. True. So if you wanted to transplant it later on in the yard someplace, you got an easier chance of doing that. Okay. All right, with that, let's go to you, Jim, with another, looks like, tree question. Yes, I have a horse chestnut question from the Chicago area. They were wondering uh, why they had uh, mat uh, mature leaves drop early this year. And there's two possibilities. Uh, horse chestnuts are prone to a horse chestnut leaf blotch. And with the wet spring we had, they got it. Uh, and that does cause early defoliation. But the other thing is that their horse chestnuts and Ohio buckeyes are very, very shallow rooted. Their uh, feet are right on the surface, uh, and that makes them prone to drought. And we had 37 days this fall without rain, and that dry spell could have caused the leaves to just fall off because it was too dry. Mm -hmm. So two possibilities, leaf disease and the drought. Wow. Well, and, and because it was so wet, you, you have to think that might have done some root damage, right. and so the roots True. would have been compromised. And then when you when you it goes turns dry, it, you're you've got a double whammy going. Right, yeah. <coughs> which is another reason to water the trees and the shrubs <laughs> going into the winter, as the roots are going to regenerate themselves during the cool winter months. Yes. Wow, we have just They're taken all care related. of everything. <laughs> this is really good. Thank you, folks, very much. Well, let's go to our mag quiz next. What would a gardener do with a dibber or dibble? A, scrape mud off of spades and trowels. B, make holes in soil for transplanting seedlings. C, grade particles according to size. B, make holes in soil for transplanting seedlings. They are very useful. I have my dibble. Well, we're going to uh, try to answer Susan's question about peonies really quick on line two. Hi, Susan. Hi. I planted some new um, Ito peonies um, this summer, and I wanted to know how to prepare them for winter. Excellent question. Oh, the Ito hybrids are great. Okay. Um, 
just take the foliage off for the winter months because mm -hmm. that has a good chance of leading to diseases next spring. And again, going back to the water and the mulching, that's really all. But Edo hybrids, like the regular hybrid peonies, are tend to be very winter hardy, so we mm -hmm. really don't have any problem with that. But make sure, again, remove that foliage that has died so it doesn't contribute to the diseases that Jim loves yep. next year. <laughs> he loves those diseases. Yeah, well, and, and mulching it will help, too, because if they're planted that, that recently, uh, depending on where you are, if you have a clay soil, they might frost heave with freezing and thawing. And we should mention that the Edos are a cross between tree peonies and the old herbaceous ones, and so they have characteristics of both, and they're outstanding. Excellent. And mulching, that's what I've been doing yep. with this mild late yep. fall. It's, it really makes, I think, all the difference. That and the watering. Oh, yes, and the water. <laughs> Did I not mention watering? <laughs> you have stock in, it. You have stock <laughs> in an irrigation company. Well, <laughs> thank you folks so much yeah. for being here and you for watching. We thank you for watching. Have a great week gardening. Bye-bye.